We all know how important trees are. They suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and replace it with oxygen. They intercept rainfall, reducing the impact of flooding. And in urban areas, they can keep our living spaces just a little bit cooler, sheltering us from the effects of climate change. And of course, these trees are homes to a wide range of wildlife species. But trees are under threat. For too long, we've misunderstood these plants that we live alongside. Typically, we attach human characteristics to things we see in the environment. So for example, people might see faces in clouds where there are no faces. This is innately human. And I think this is one of the challenges that trees face that we just do not understand. Them. If we saw a human with a dead limb, we'd be really concerned about that. Or if the human had decay in their teeth, again, cause for concern, and none of us like going to the dentist. However, dead limbs on trees, decaying wood in trees is absolutely fine. It's a normal part of the aging and dying process that we see. And it's this very process that makes these trees extremely valuable for wildlife. So the decaying wood itself may be a food source for wood-dwelling invertebrates. Or it could be that the hollowed-out cavity or the spit or crack could be used by nesting birds or maybe roosting bats. But because we've misunderstood trees for so long, they've been systematically removed from our landscape. And we're now in a position where we have many wonderful old trees and we're blessed in the UK for having lots of ancient and veteran trees. We also have lots of young trees, either through a result of natural regeneration or through tree planting. But crucially, we're missing the ones in the middle. So our ancient and veteran trees, these trees, extremely valuable for wildlife because of the decaying wood and the splits and the cracks within them. They won't be with us forever. And we need the next generation of trees to come through to replace them. But because of this gap we've got in the middle, we need to wait extra long for those young trees to get old enough to develop those features. So we're literally racing against the clock here to conserve many of our wildlife species that are reliant on old and decaying trees. We're out in the woods today doing some work to try and conserve two tree-dwelling bat species. And these are Barberstown and Beckstein's bats. Both of them are heavily reliant on trees for places to live. So Beckstein's bats will spend all of the summer in hollow trees, typically in features such as woodpecker holes, where you have a nice cavity for the bats to roost in. But come winter, they will head underground to things like caves, mines and tunnels to see out the cold winter months. Similarly, Barberstow will spend a great deal of time in trees, but they favour features such as splits and cracks. We call these crevices and they like to get in and wedge themselves in with back and belly contact and ensure that they're safe in those features. The Barberstow are a little bit more plastic than Beckstein's, though they can turn up in buildings from time to time. But pretty much they will wait out in the trees until it gets just far too cold to stay out in the woodlands and again they will head underground. When we're conserving any wildlife species, what we seek to do is understand its habitat requirements and ensure that those are provided within our landscapes. And for certain species, we are very good at this. We can understand it and we can provide it. So for bat species that roost in buildings, we can quite easily replicate those features. We can provide tiles that are lifted or maybe gaps beneath lead flashing or behind weatherboarding. But for bats that roost in trees, our options are much more limited. Historically, our approach has been to use bat boxes. These are similar to bird nests boxes that you may see in your garden but the problem is that they just don't provide the ideal roosting conditions for bats. The project we're working on is trying to work out whether we can create features in trees for bats and given enough time the trees will create them naturally however we don't have time anymore. so instead of using time we're using tools to see if we can create these features. So we're out today cutting holes in trees specifically targeted at those two species in the hope that we can learn more about their roosting ecology and provide future roosting.